Hi, everybody. This is Jose Palomino again with Business Growth on Purpose. And our guest today is Charles or Carlos Fry. And Charles is the CEO of a company called Code Exitos. And they are focused on bringing digital products to life. He'll tell us more about that as we get going. But we're also going to explore really important topics about the modern workplace, how to get people working together, really collaborating, and the challenges that presents, especially for an international business like Charles. So let's welcome Charles right now so we can learn more about the future of connected business. Well, welcome, Charles, to Business Growth on Purpose. Hey, thanks to be here, Jose. Yeah, so uh, so Charles, just for our audience, uh, if you could just give us context of uh, what do you do and who do you do it for? Yeah, Code Exitos is a product development company, and we help entrepreneurs and innovators design, build, and launch digital products. Uh, by digital products, we mean either software, for example, a SaaS platform, mm -hmm. uh, could be a mobile app, combinations thereof, and um, uh, also hardware. So we do IoT. We're getting into sensors and IoT-related devices, and those are usually a mashup of there's you know, there's some sensor, for example, that's connected to a mobile app or a cloud platform. So that's the stuff we build. Wow. So that that's interesting. So uh, just curious, how, how does that business come to you? I mean, like, does it do you have to go out and find it or are people looking for the kind of expertise you have and, you know, you're you're all over Google and so on? Yeah, well, we try to be all over Google and so on. Um, but, you know, we actively go out and sell. Uh, we have a great team of uh, channel partners that know our work. Uh, they're usually consultancies. And okay. so uh, Codexitos tends to be more on the construction side of the continuum. You know, some, some organizations are brilliant at market research and consultancy, and they say, hey, Jose, this is what you should do. Um, we're more about getting the thing done. So okay. you can think of us as builders more than anything. Uh, and by the way, I love your, I love your podcast and your guests. A lot of them are manufacturers building real things, which is mm -hmm. super cool. Uh, I could probably spend a week listening to all your guests. Um, but we're builders. We fancy ourselves as creative builders. And, and so we're, we have a lot in common with your manufacturing uh, listeners. Okay. And what's interesting about that, uh, you know, manufacturing is moving heavily into IoT for management of the shop floor and for better metrics. We've had guests that actually build platforms around that. So I see that as being clearly uh, the whole IoT space is, is a, that's like the next frontier of real growth, in my opinion. Uh, a lot of things that's going to, because it hasn't, it's not mature yet. It's not all there yet. Oh, it's a long, it's a long way from being all there, but um, it's a great example. We we just talked to a manufacturer. They're in the construction materials business, and their innovation is what they need help with is their customers. They're they sort of build and manufacture to custom outcomes that uh, people in the construction industry need, and they wanted tools that connected that field sales force went all the way back into the manufacturing process so they could track things like lot numbers of steel that were used and everything else. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not just ongoing IT tweaks. This thing has to be finished and done and put in the hands of customers and, and builders and other uh, parties that are working with the company. So it's a cool project, but you're right. There's a lot of innovation happening in that space and it's fun. Well, it's interesting, though, because when you talk about digital products as distinct from, let's say, IT development. Yeah. So what, one of the big dif differences, of course, that you just alluded to it, if you have corporate IT and something's not 100 percent right, you call IT, you can get it corrected and so on. But if you're making a product that has to deploy and work, it has yeah. to be, you know, you don't it's not tethered to just like being internal. It's an external manifestation of whatever it is you're trying to create. So the you know QA uh, actual usability all that stuff gets into it. So I'm I'm just interested in how you got into this space and because it's a it's a heavy lift. Yeah, it is. Um, so I'm I'm a tech entrepreneur junkie my whole career. Uh, Thirty years in the tech space, almost all of those have been building and launching products uh, okay. of one sort or another. Uh, some of them have been venture backed. Some of them have been bootstrapped. Okay. Um, 
different journeys, uh, depending. Um, but I, it's just what I love to do. I love to see something come to life and get finished at a level that, if, as, as you pointed out, or certainly sounds like you're familiar with, uh, and your listeners know that when you have to put something in the hands of a customer, uh, you just think differently about it. You go about producing it differently and it has a different life cycle than, you know, the internal type of IT work that you talked about. That that tends to fall in the realm of uh, continuous improvement, cost management, all those kind of very difficult management challenges. But producing a product is quite a bit different. So we've, we just, just chose to focus on building product and that keeps our entire team focused on the same kind of mental framework, I guess, of like, Hey, we're going to have a customer for this thing and it's got to be right. So that, that raises, you know, one of the questions I like to ask our guests in the last couple of months, especially is as we're looking at this transition now that the world's going through from, you know, lockdown COVID to now post COVID reality. Although I realize COVID is still a thing. It's still out there. But as a practical matter, day to day, we're living back. We're trying to go back to some sort of pre-COVID normal. However, <laughs> that's not necessarily going to be the, the case, right? So you're going to have people working a lot more, especially younger people wanting to say, no, I don't want to go to the office five days a week. You know, count me out, yeah. which is amazing, right? Like in two years, that just changed how everybody looked at work. So my question to you is how a, a two part a, are the type of things you're being asked to work on different in light of the last couple of years? And is how you're approaching serving your clients different in light of the last couple of years? Like, is it going to stay different? Uh, okay. So the first one's pretty easy. I don't think it's different because of COVID. The, the kind of things that people are bringing to us are not COVID related in their difference. Principally, our clients are always on the front edge of technology because it sort of makes sense. If you're an entrepreneur or you're an innovator, uh, you're not going to be writing something in, you know, DBase 3 from uh, the 1990s. I've used DBase 3. I, 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 yeah, I, I sense that we had some age commonality there, but uh, I'll go ahead and say I'm older than you, Jose. But um, So no, I mean, our our customers are still building very modern you know, right up into cryptocurrency and NFT. We do, we work in that space. I mean, some of it's pretty edgy and it's exciting, AI, whatever. Um, the second question is, is really interesting. Uh, and I think the answer is a resounding yes, we operate in a different way. And no, we probably won't go back to the way it was pre-COVID. Uh, the, dis the disruption has hit our work. So for example, our team is distributed across the United States, Mexico, Central and South America. We have 125 people. Uh, we work out of development centers or so headquarters in Austin, Texas. We have two large product studios in Central America. We're going to be opening a product studio, which you, an office, if you will, uh, in Colombia in 2023. But, uh, our clients work remotely. Sometimes our entire client team is remote. They're not even local to one another. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the, work, the work mode has changed pretty dramatically. I don't think we've figured it out or we have it right yet. In fact, I was listening to your question and was wondering if you were reading our email. Uh, we have a lot of young, bright people right out, you know, they're less than 10 years out of university, a lot of times less than five. And there's just a lot missing with being a full remote. So we're working on a hybrid or hub and spoke model. And then our clients love to come and visit. But uh, yeah, it's it's a different world than it was five years ago, for sure. Yeah, I remember uh, years ago, I had a friend that worked for a major systems integrator, and I remember visiting him. And I've been in that space for a good a good amount of time. Yeah. And everything was built around like these virtual rooms where the, the walls would move and it could make a like a huddle. Right. And so you'd have 10, 12 people physically within five feet of each other. Right. Like that was the whole goal. Yeah. Because they wanted to create that kind of instant collaboration, creative sparking of one another and so on. Yeah. Uh, when I worked at Tandem Computers way earlier in my career, there was 
always whiteboards everywhere throughout the office. And it was intended that you could just walk by and say, hey, I got an idea and so on. Yeah. So that's just very hard to duplicate through virtual means. It just is. It, 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 doing a whiteboard, it's not impossible. There are ways to do it. It's yeah. just harder to do and it's not as organic. So very interesting that you, you, know, you have this international workforce and yet even, and these are people who grew up with technology, right? They're, 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 not, oh, they're, yeah. not, they're not immigrants to that technology. They are natives. Yeah, they're um, dig digital natives. For digital sure. natives, but they still have, there's still a human factor issue that still has to be kind of resolved. Like people do want to have some touch and so on. So finding that balance, um, you know, I, I'm just curious how, how you're going to pursue that because so far, anyone I've talked to about this, no one has said we got this thing dialed in or we had it figured out. So they're all kind of works in progress. Well, Apple Computer uh, just announced, and, it, and this is in the Wall Street Journal today. Uh, what day is today? The 23rd, if right. anybody wants to reference it, that Apple's telling all of its workers that they have to come back in three days a week. Uh, Elon Musk, about a month ago, you know, famously or infamously, according to Elon, uh, told everybody they better get their butt back in five days a week at a minimum. Uh, at a minimum. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty outrageous uh, statement, typ <laughs> typical for Elon Musk. Right. Um, yeah, how are we dealing with it? We've we've spent the last couple of years, the COVID time, getting as just getting as good as we can be with those kind of remote work from anywhere tools, mm -hmm. digital whiteboards, all that other stuff, collaborative zoom sessions um and we're not gonna get away from those but i th i think the announcement from apple sounds pretty close it's gonna be look hey guys two three days maybe four days you're gonna have to be in there and collaborate uh we're actually converting our our innovation centers we call them spark spaces mm. um love the, don't love the name by the way that's great hey, I love hey thanks um we're converting those, the, the mode of those into being more like a co-working space. Mm -hmm. So we're big believers in giving everyone on the team um, a lot of autonomy. So the teams can decide when they're going to be in, they can schedule time, they can spe schedule space. Um, so it's not like an assigned office in the traditional sense that this is Jose's desk and this is Carlos's desk. Mm -hmm. It's just like, hey, you booked it for the day or you booked it for the week. Um, that's what we're working on right now. I, I can't tell you that we have any super fantastic results or super terrible results. Um, I think it's going to take a, a couple more years for everybody to find what fits and what works. All right. So work in progress. I mean, it really is a study in culture and the generational shifts on people also, and then the enablement that technology affords. Uh, but it's, it's not, I, my sense is, you know, we'll look back on this time period 10 years from now and say, oh, yeah, that was that crazy time when we were trying to do X, Y, or Z. It'll all look different because we just can't predict, you know, so that's just an interesting time. Yeah. And the the younger people, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the the people, uh, you as you point out, digital natives, but they've never been in a traditional office. So they're typically, you know, under 25. Mm -hmm. And I mean, look, if the, when I can remember when I was 25, you had to learn basic skills like show up on time mm -hmm. every day, be dressed. You know, we had we had a guy walk in one of our development centers the other day. Uh, I, I'll just say that my my ration to business response to him was, hey, are you going to the beach because you don't look like you're dressed for the office? And he's like, what? This is a, this is a problem. I mean, I'm like, yeah, tank top shorts and flip flops doesn't work when you come to work. It's for the beach. And so it's a lot of that little professional polish that I'm worried that we're going to lose uh, a generation of, of young men and women who are otherwise brilliant, but haven't been just required to learn how to work in an environment that's not perfect for you or to work with coworkers that you might, you know, the guy beside me choose too loud or, you know, <laughs> uh, right. And no. those are ad adaptations that we had to right. make. And if I continue, I'll, I'll, I risk sounding like an old guy and I don't mean to, I love, I love working with the current generation that we have in the company, but it's all, it's super subtle stuff.
It, it is. It's interesting. You know, just those examples of, of it really comes down to how do we collaborate better? So yeah. the technology really allows you to work better in isolation and share your work product together. So two people can do their own thing. They, but that's not real collaboration, which comes from more casual connections of neurons, right? Like when you just, just going to be, Hey, you want to grab a coffee? Yeah, let's go grab a coffee. And then on the way you talk, you know, I've been working on this problem and Oh, really? You, and, and that just becomes a very natural conversation. But if you try to plan that, let's have a 30 minute brainstorming session on problem X. It isn't really even how our brains work. Uh, yeah, inspiration, you can't put inspiration on a clock. Exactly. I mean, you can put work on a clock, but inspiration is going to happen when it happens. So it's just a fascinating thing. Uh, Charles didn't mean to spend so much time on it. No, but that's okay. No, it's a, it's a topic that consumes me. Uh, it's, it's not a waste at all. The, the one thing before we move on, and I know you've got other things, but it's also a management issue because I've all, I've been a long time adherent to servant leadership. My job is to empower and bring out the best in people. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're a high effective, highly effective coach, you know my job is to push you beyond what you personally think you can achieve. So, um, I would a lot of those tools disappear in a virtual world. If I only see you for that scheduled thirty minute Zoom, I can't calibrate what I'm trying to give you by coaching just by casual observation. So yeah, it's not just, it's just not an employee entitlement thing. It's a whole, we're going to have to learn to be better managers with a set of tools that we didn't expect to have to use quite this way. So. Yeah, it isn't, what is the old Euler Packard management by walking around? A hundred percent. There's no more walking around. There's no walking around. And it's like, hey, did Jose show up today? Is he doing anything? Is he <laughs> sick? I mean, is there something wrong? Right. Yeah, it takes right. a lot. It takes, it, it's been, uh, it's been jarring interesting wow so now i'm fascinated you have uh several design centers throughout latin america yeah right? so yep. so and i i've you know i've to, over the years i've talked to people who've done other kind of technology outsourcing to or subsidiaries in other parts of the world but not typically latin america mm -hmm. i just i've run more into like eastern europe and things yep. like that yep. so uh you know coming from latin american background that i do i'm just curious uh you know what what made that area of the world interesting to you to develop this technology you know these, these technology cutting edge technology centers yeah well uh two things one uh having been a cio and a cto uh, a number of times on my own i'd outsourced work tens of millions of dollars of it development work i've outsourced all over the world i've traveled all over the world i've been happy to do that india russia when they weren't quite what they are today uh eastern europe uh probably a few other places i'm forgetting but it's not important and you know there's there's one thing that isn't going to change jose and that's geography and time zones mm. and uh so when i started code exitos the idea was to build the service provider the professional services provider that i always wanted and uh I was just telling someone last night that you know, my business strategy is I looked at a map, you know, and so uh, Latin America makes a lot of sense. It's close. Uh, our clients, sometimes our clients ask us if we're an, an offshore or a nearshore company. And I said, well, it's interesting you ask because uh, I can fly from Houston, Texas to San Pedro Sula, Honduras, where one of our development centers is. And that's a two hour and 15 minute flight. But I recently flew from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles, and that was a two hour and 45 minute flight. So maybe Los Angeles is offshore. Uh, I don't know. Well, it might you be know. for other reasons. But. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew you would go there. I knew you would go there. Uh, but no, I love Los Angeles, by the way. It's a beautiful place. But those are the kind of things that people don't realize, I think, when they're thinking about Latin America, because you're right, it's been overlooked. And it's like, wait, we we should be we should be actively working with this uh, resource pool. So wow. that's what and, I and, and yeah, the, I mean, the opportunities and, and uh, not, not to get controversial, but just, you know, the economic development life cycle in Latin America has to move into, you know, first world position, which is technology, IT. And so, so I, I feel very, uh, to me, that's exciting that those opportunities exist. 
Well, you touched on with, without me saying what my second piece was, I think one of my response was there were two things and I gave you one, look at a map. The other one is uh, it's actually in the slogan for Code Exitos, uh, brilliant minds in a digital world. And if you, anyone that wants to come to Latin America will find very, very smart people, whether they're engineers or marketers or, or whatever. I mean, they're, they're brilliant people. And the local economies don't provide an opportunity that's commensurate with their skills and their ability. And so their opportunity is to leave. I mean, that's the best outcome for them. And that's the epitome of brain drain. When the best people in the, the economy, the people with the most ability to contribute value, when their best economic and, and lifestyle option is to leave, you're in a downward spiral. Right. And so Code Exitos operates here and... That's the second reason I wanted to be here was to start to tilt that uh, balance a little bit back to where people in Central America can have great jobs. They can work on great products for great entrepreneurs and they don't have to leave and they get paid well. They get paid much better than they would with a local job. So that's our that's kind of our whole B corporation purpose. Statement. No, yeah, but it's, you know, doing, doing well by doing good. I mean, it's, 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 100%. it's a, it's a positive thing. And then at the end, also, you're able to, you know, produce exciting things for your clients. So if somebody listening to this today, Charles uh, said, well, gee, this sounds interesting. What, what kind of need should they have uh, in anticipation of needing or wanting to speak to you? What is it? What's, what are they processing now? As yeah. they listen and say, boy, I should talk to Charles. What should that be? What would be a typical situation? Um, I would say that anyone who's listening that has an idea, a burning idea for a product they want to invent, build, or launch as a business, uh, we want to talk to them. I mean, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to people who have ideas that we can't help with, but that's okay. Uh, we want to see people be successful. So I would say uh, one class is the entrepreneurs. The other class is uh, your, for your uh, maybe more traditional manufacturing companies and stuff. You know, they're in a fight for the customer mind space. And if they think that there's a technological edge that they can get through an innovation in their business, whether it's on the plant floor or it's in their sales uh, efforts, yeah, just call us up. I mean, <laughs> you know, our time's free. So uh, we jump on Zoom calls. If they're in Austin, Texas, and I'm there, then we meet in person. But a Zoom wow. call is usually a good way to start. And where should they and where should they go to 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 initiate that? Well, I think you put in, in the show notes our website's codexitos.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Charles Fry. And uh, the only thing on LinkedIn that I would tell people is if you if you send me a connection request, please just put a little note in it because I get about a hundred requests a week yeah. from people that want to lease me a car or sell me right, a, right. you know, you, you get them too, right? You know, right. the email Yeah, stuff. but just tell you what it is that they're interested in. Yeah, just tell me what about. you want to know about it. So it's, there's no barrier to entry other than I have to know that, you know, there's something for us to talk about. That's it. All right. Well, Charles Fry, thank you for stopping by Business Growth on Purpose. I appreciate it. Hey, I enjoyed the time. Thanks, Jose. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. If you like the show, hit subscribe and leave us a review to help other people find the podcast. And if you're ready to take the next step in driving intentional growth for your business, come check out what we're doing at valueprop.com. We've developed industry-leading programs and systems to help B2B owners take control of their growth. Until then, thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose.